Greetings, you're listening to Wolf and Tune, and I am the wolf of Wolf and Tune. And we are talking to Danny Goldberg. Danny has done a lot of things in the record business. We brushed shoulders uh, many years ago. He doesn't remember me very well, but I'm not a very memorable guy sometimes, I guess. And uh, he's done a lot of different things. He started out as a journalist. He was a publicist, a manager, and oh, by the way, manager of one of the biggest groups in the history of pop, Nirvana. He also ran three different major labels. And Danny is also something I'm jealous of. He's a best-selling, according to the LA Times, best-selling list a best-selling author. He has a book out right now about Kurt Cobain called Serving the Servant, and he's working on a new book, which we'll be talking about. So, of course, we're covering the music business, uh, the ins and outs of showbiz, marketing, payola, ego, the life of an artist, the pressures of being an artist, the role of a manager, specifically his relationship with Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love, And his spiritual journey, which started at the same time as he started in the record business, late 60s, around there, when he hooked up with Ram Dass and uh, was very influenced by Ram Dass and people around Ram Dass. And then he had his own spiritual teacher. And since then, he's been doing a tango with contemplative culture and that sphere of wisdom, and now has settled into his own daily meditation practice. So let's talk to Danny. Okay, thank you, Danny Goldberg, for agreeing to uh, have some dialogue with me. Oh, I'm so happy to talk to you. Thank you. And you're ready to subject yourselves to some of my sharply bobbed questioning, I'm sure. I'll, I'll try to handle it. I, you know, I, I, I don't know if I'm up to the task, but I'll give it my best. So uh, recently, uh, our mutual friend Krishna Das introduced us. Yes. Or I should say, he really, he reintroduced us because apparently we had some sort of relationship like 25 years ago. Well, I, I am so sorry to tell you I don't remember that, but uh, <laughs> that was a period of my life where I was dealing with literally hundreds of things a day, and, and I forgot a lot from that time. But I'm happy to talk to you now, and anybody who uh, I meet through Krishnadas is a, automatically a special person. He's one of my favorite people in the world. Yeah, yeah, it is funny. I for the life of me, I can't remember. I mean, you were you came to my studio, and uh, I can't remember why. But uh, from this, you know, we have a trail of nice notes that uh, apparently passed between us, uh, or at least there's, there's one nice note, and uh, that's from 1995 when you were at Warner Brothers. And for the life of me, I can't remember why, but I'm thinking I did a lot of stuff remixing wise with Prince and Seal and around that time so it must be something to do with that but in any case I agree with you it's great to have you here and so we got a lot to talk about because you're such a multifaceted fascinating person not only with a terrific career and track record in the music business but you've always been politically involved engaged uh, you've been a leader in po- in political issues uh, you have uh, intellectual curiosity, you're a meditator, and you're a best-selling author. I was happy to see you on the LA Times bestseller list. Did you, you know about this? I did know about it, and it was really an exciting moment for me because it was the first time one of my books was on any bestseller list. And uh, so I, 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 I noted it, and I, uh, I emailed it to some of my friends. Yes, fantastic. What's the title of the book? That book is called Serving the Servants, Remembering Kurt Cobain. And the hardback came out in April of last year, and the paperback just came out a couple of months ago. Nice, nice. Yeah, it was great to see that on the LA Times bestseller list. Um, All right, so you started as a journalist in the music business. How did you go from being a journalist to being a manager? Well, in between, I was a publicist. And, and what happened is um, I couldn't make a living as a journalist. You know, I, I, uh, I was not at my most disciplined time in my life. I was in my early 20s. You know, I dropped out of college when I was 17. So I, I, I was sort of in that music journalism world very young. And, um, but I had, in, in a few years of trying to make it as a journalist, I'd met a lot of other rock, mostly rock journalists. It was a subculture in the early 70s that was pretty 
genre specific and there were a lot of rock magazines then so the 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 job that i could get was as a publicist because you know the publicist job is to know writers and to pitch them on stories and um from being a public you know as a publicist uh, at a certain point i became led zeppelin's publicist they hired a company i was working for and i was the young guy with long hair that they were dealing with and um and I got to meet their manager, Peter Grant, who was this uh, very powerful figure, both physically and in, in terms of kind of dominating any room that he was in. And the record company people all kind of catered to him and the concert promoters. Of course, he was representing Led Zeppelin, the biggest act in the world. And I just thought that looked like a great job, you know, because he made a lot more money than publicists and were closer to the artists and were involved with every aspect of their career. And uh, that became my aspiration. It took me quite a few years to actually become a manager because, you know, artists have to want you to be their manager. And I, I had to develop enough uh, of a reputation and gravitas, I guess, to be able to get clients. So, so I was a journalist, then a publicist, and then um, and then became a, and then became a manager uh, in the 1980s. Okay, so what is it about being a journalist that leads you to becoming a manager what qualities talents skills that you have as a journalist well the first step was 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 that i knew other journalists and it allowed me to become a publicist and then i really had to learn the craftsmanship of being a publicist and i became a much better publicist than i had ever been as a journalist and and that got me connected to zeppelin then zeppelin hired me uh, peter grant really hired me but you know was officially the group hired me to, to be the so-called vice president of their newly formed label swan song this was a period when you know the beatles had their label and the stones had their label and it was kind of a badge of success for a super group to get their own label and so in that capacity i dealt primarily it was just for the united states i wasn't globally involved with them but the united states is a big place and in that capacity, I was the liaison to Atlantic Records, who was their distributor and partner and dealt with also the radio promotion department and the sales department. So after a couple of years of that, I, at least I had experience with record companies. So then I had two things that I knew. One was that I had knew something about how to deal with a record company and, and what the different departments did. And the other was that I had... Um, that I had been a, a publicist, so I really understood how to... How to particularly focus on that aspect of an artist's career. And um, those were my main selling points initially. And, uh, you know, uh, over time I got better at it. You know, uh, the other thing is when I worked for Zeppelin is because Peter Grant also managed, I mean, they, he had the label Swan Song, but he also managed Bad Company and Maggie Bell and Zeppelin. So I got involved in the United States of being his liaison to the booking agencies. So at that point I was able to meet the concert promoters and know some of the agents. So I had at least some connectivity with some of the main things that were important to artists. And, and, and I had this uh, irrational confidence that uh, eventually made people think I, I would be a good manager. And then over time, actually learned how to do it. You know, there's no credentialing process for a manager. It's just getting a client who says you're the manager. That's the cr credentialing. But over time, if you actually get good at it, then people kind of recommend you for things. So, you know, it's a 50 year career. So I'm summarizing in a few sentences, the, right. some of the steps. Right. So people recommend you because of, you know, you start to develop, develop a track record. Yeah. Um, so probably people came to you and said, you know, there's this terrific group in, in Seattle and we recommended you to them or they, they tell you, you should reach out. How did, how did you reach Nirvana? Well, we're now flashing forward to 1990. So by that time, I'm 40 years old and I've been in the business for, uh, you know, more than 20 years. And I had a management company called Gold Mountain. And we had just had a big success with Bonnie Raitt, who had gone from being dropped by Warner Brothers Records. We got a new deal. And the first album in the new deal was Nick of Time, which ended up winning the Grammy for album of the year. And I, uh, you know, that was a that was a real uh, high point. And uh, we'd had some other successful artists too, Belinda Carlisle, uh, who'd had uh, hit singles as a solo artist, and had one version of the Allman Brothers Band, who in every iteration were a great touring band. And I knew that I was not in touch, however, with this next younger generation of people 
in their in their teens and twenties uh, who were kind of creating this eighties uh, uh, iteration of punk rock in America. Uh, you know, a culture that, that, that initially was typified by bands like Black Flag and um, Dead Kennedys that weren't particularly commercially successful. But then as the 80s went on, you, you, Jane's Addiction emerged, being successful, R.E.M. coming out of the indie world was successful. And I wanted to figure out how to connect with that because now I'm an old man of 40. So I hired a young guy, his name is John Silva today. He's mm. one of the most uh, successful managers in the business. He has the Foo Fighters and... Yeah. Many other many other artists. At that time, he was in his early 20s. He knew everything about this punk rock indie world. He knew the fanzines and the seven inches and all of the uh, the music. Uh, uh, and, and I knew the music business and had money to pay him a salary, which he needed. So we teamed up and um, and within a few months, we were able to sign Sonic Youth. Sonic Youth had just um decided to make their first major label album. They'd done a number of albums when indie labels weren't getting paid, uh, and they decided they wanted to uh, be able to, uh, you know, buy a loft and have some money so they could quit their day jobs. Mm -hmm. And they had signed with uh, um, Geffen Records, mm -hmm. and they had a manager who they had a falling out with. And so, uh, like a month or six weeks before their first Geffen album, which was called Goo, was going to come out. They had to find a new manager. We found out about that, and we were able to meet with them, and they liked us, and we became Sonic Youth's manager. And uh, that was a huge turning point because uh, Sonic Youth, in particular, Thurston Moore and Kim Gordon, were so brilliant in their understanding of what was going on in the indie rock world globally. They were incredible curators. They, they, so many artists got their starts by being the opening act on a Sonic Youth show, and one of them that they put on as an opening act was Nirvana. So uh, I heard about them both from John, who had seen them op uh, uh, open to, to and, and Thurston from Sonic Youth called me and said, I know you usually don't like new acts because you know the problem with new acts for a manager is it takes a couple of years to get paid. He says, I know you don't usually like new acts, but believe me, this is the best band I've seen in years. And I, I did believe him. He was Thurston Moore. He was so smart. So I said, if you say that, I definitely want to meet with them. And they came and met with us, and they immediately decided to come with us as managers, I think for the same reason, because if Sonic Youth said we were okay and we were good enough for Sonic Youth, then then probably uh, good enough for uh, for them. Oh, so, hold, um, hold on, there goes your phone. Well, I turned the ringer off. It was... Uh, <laughs> It was a uh, clearly not somebody I needed to talk to, so I'm <laughs> I'm I'm braving it now, uh, naked, in case uh, one of my kids or clients calls. I'll have to call them back in an hour. So um, so that was it, you know. Uh, but so it was really Thurston Moore was 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 the main uh, reason, uh, and uh, it was one of the luckiest things that ever happened to me was uh, uh, that set of circumstances. Right, but I mean, you rose to the occasion. Apparently. From all indications, you had a good, close, trusting relationship with uh, Kurt Cobain. Um, I loved him very, very much, and he was great to me. It was an amazing thing to be part of, very exciting and very sad, depending on which time of those three and a half years you know, one focuses on. Yeah, so why do you think he liked you so much why did he well, feel so I, comfortable I, with you you know i i you know i i wouldn't want to completely speculate because i can't get into someone else's head but i think that one big thing was that when he fell in love with courtney love that i recognized that he was in love with her and that it wasn't just like kind of some one night stand and a lot of the other people around nirvana were not very supportive of that relationship so that kind of created a personal connection between us. Prior to that, I was kind of the older guy that knew how to deal with the record company. And after mm -hmm. that, I, w I had a more personal relationship with him uh, where, where, when, where, where he would usually come to me on things that mattered to him in, in the general business world. Uh, but, you know, um, who knows why? I think that he liked that I was kind of political, you know, and had the ACLU affiliation mm -hmm. and... I think he liked that I'd work for Led Zeppelin, you know, although he played a very different kind of music. He was a great student of all of rock and roll and knew how important they were and 
you know, and then there's just that intangible connection that you have with some people and you don't have with others. ACLU, you were the director of the Americans for Civil Liberties? No, director, executive director is the person who actually does the work and runs it. I was the chairman of the foundation board of the Southern California ACLU, which primarily was the fundraising vehicle for it, but also were involved with uh, connectivity to Hollywood at the time because in those, you know, and, and during that time, the Rodney King incident happened and ACLU was very involved with that. So it was a volunteer part-time affiliation, but I, I had some visibility doing it. I'd write an op-ed every once in a while about uh, things and, uh, you know, uh, was known to be a supporter of them and, and still am a supporter of the ACLU, even though I no longer play that role. Right. So you say you had a personal relationship with Kurt Cobain. Did he, like, call you up in the middle of the night and he'd say, oh, that Courtney Love, you know, we had a fight? And He never called me up in the middle of the night. I don't remember one time that that happened. You know, um, you know I know that, 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 that I've, I've known other managers who've had that. I've been really lucky. I, I don't think I've had too many artists call me in the middle of the night, and he, he didn't. And um, usually he would call me about, uh, you know, there were so many issues that came up, uh, in the press, the press gave an enormous amount of scrutiny to Kurt and Courtney. You know, today rock and roll is kind of a, a, a great art form, but it's a secondary pop genre. In those days, they were as famous then as like you know Beyonce is right. today or right. Justin Bieber. They, they 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 were dealing with all sorts of scrutiny from the press. There were issues sometimes about business with the other band members dealing with MTV. Uh, uh, you know, all, you, you know a wide variety of things. I did my best to describe them in the book um and uh you know i i don't but 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 uh he no he never called me and said that well did he confide in you i mean obviously he has a reputation of being seriously depressed and so you must have witnessed that at some point he was and, definitely prone to depression i mean obviously he's more likely to talk to me when he wasn't depressed because depressed people often like kind of don't say anything but, uh, you, you know, he struggled with depression and, uh, you know, tried different doctors and different antidepressants and, you know, uh, so on. So, I mean, uh, you know, there were there were sometimes conversations about that. You know, I mean, it was uh, my main role, though, was to manage his career, not to manage mm-hmm. his personal life. Right. But did you ever try to cheer him up? And if you did, how would you do that? I don't know. You know, um, it's 25 years since he passed away, 26 years now. And uh, I just try to connect with somebody and usually humor or, you know, warmth or, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. caring, listening, you know. uh, Right. He was very involved with his career, right, in the details of... uh, Oh, he was totally, uh, totally involved. He was a absolute genius. And his genius was about the entire array of things that a rock artist would be involved with. He he designed the album covers, he storyboarded the videos, uh, you know, he, he wrote the uh, lyrics and the music to almost all the songs. There's a couple of them that were jams, but all the famous songs, he wrote the music and the lyrics. Uh, he made all the decisions for the band. Uh, uh, he thought about the interviews a great deal. He rarely repeated himself. He thought about what T-shirt he was going to wear because he knew he was going to be photographed. Uh, you know, he had a real extraordinary understanding uh, of uh, of the whole job of being a rock star. And uh, uh, in that part of his brain functioned at an incredibly high level. Right. And I know the last time we spoke, we talked about your interventions um, attempted interventions into his addiction. And it seemed to me that this was, even though I heard you speak about it at Book Soup, uh, the last time we spoke about it, it seemed to be a painful issue. So I'm, I think I'm going to avoid that uh, right I, now. I, well, yeah, of course, it's always painful dealing with a drug addict. I don't think there's any happy interventions. But in your experience with artists, this is not the only time. It can't be. And in, in, in the record business, all those years you spent, you must have encountered time and time again artists or other individuals in the music business with mental health issues. Well, um, you know, it depends on which part of my career. You know, there were 13 years where I ran record companies. And when you're at a record company, you don't have the same relationship with an artist that you do as a manager. 
Um, as a manager, I mean, first of all, I'm, it's not really appropriate for me to talk about anything personal with people I've worked with. Kurt's things were so public uh, and he's passed away. You know, when the book came out, it was 25 years. Now it's 26 years. I felt it was appropriate for me to deal with certain things that were part of the public record anyway. Uh, right. But, um, you know, I try to avoid people that are self-destructive. I mean, every once in a while, someone seems like they're not self-destructive and then goes on, takes a wrong turn. But, um, you know, uh, it, it, it's... Um, I never dealt with anybody. I never managed anyone else that had the level of issues that he had. I've known, unfor unfortunately, I've known other people that killed themselves, but I thank God never managed anyone else who killed themselves. Right. Well, it's not just that ext those extreme, you know, examples. It's just that in the music business itself, there are the different levels on the spectrum of, of mental health issues. Yeah, but I'm not a therapist or a priest. I'm a, I'm, I'm a professional whose job it is to try to uh, be of some service to people in terms of advancing their career goals. Uh, occasionally, you get into personal conversations with people, and that's a re emotionally rewarding when you develop that relationship with somebody. But like any other personal relationship, you know, not particularly that interested in, in, in uh, gossiping or anything like that. But artists are inherently very sensitive people. Right. I do think a disproportionate amount of them have emotional issues because they're just tuned in at such a sensitive level in order to do what they do. And, uh, you know, I really um, romanticize artists and, and love being associated with them, but they are different from the rest of us in that way. They tend to be more sensitive. Yeah, Willie Nelson said that... Uh... If you're not crazy, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> Good quote. And uh, it's become a topic now that, that was at one point taboo, but now it's much more out in the open that uh, the pressures. I mean, the whole society we live in has challenges, mental health challenges. The uh, music business has the four horsemen of the musical apocalypse, which is addiction, anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts. I don't and think that's unique to the music business, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, I think those things are part of the human race. But um, I do think that artists in general, not just musicians, but painters and novelists and, uh, you know, comedians, you know, mm -hmm. that, that people that are in the creative world tend to be a little more vulnerable emotionally than, than, than other people because their job and their role in life requires them to have a sort of an openness and a sensitivity that, that can also cause pain. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, uh, it comes with being an artist. But we're in the music business, so and, and we're in a business where the top achievers from Michael Jackson, Elvis Presley, Tom Petty, you, you name it, Prince... Um, led self came to self destructive ends, but well, unfortunately, listen. I think that's tragic and true. It's not limited to them, though. I mean, Robin Williams, Vincent Van Gogh, David Foster Wallace. I mean, we could go down a long list of other people in the in in the arts. Uh, but I, you know, I don't know what to do about it. I I, I also uh, cherish the people who overcame that and had such positive lives. Look at Bruce Springsteen, who in his book wrote a lot about struggling with depression right. but boy is he overcome it in a magnificent way and bob dylan just made this incredible new album at the age of 79 and leonard cohn's last couple of albums and bb king worked almost till the day he died so thank god there's a lot of counter examples as well yeah and courtney love is still uh, alive and kicking courtney is alive uh one of the smartest and most creative people I I, uh, I, I know, complicated person, I, I, and I'm not in as close touch with her today as I was back in the uh, 90s, but uh, I, I think very highly of her. And she has a spiritual practice, right? She, she does Buddhist chanting. She's talked yeah. about this publicly, so I mentioned it to you the other day. Yeah, she's, she's done Buddhist chanting as long as I've known her, I, I, um, and, I, and I think that's... Uh, <laughs> I'm in favor of any kind of spiritual practice that people can find that connects them to defining themselves uh, in a broader context and not just based on uh, money or fame or 
what to eat next or who's mad at them or what party that you got invited to, but, but to, to see themselves as a soul. As Ram Dass used to say, think of themselves as in terms of their souls, not their roles. Yeah, to, to transcend themselves. In a well, way. transcend the yeah. ego, your transcend, true self. Yes. What is yourself? You know, so it's hard to do, and we're human beings, and even the great, you know, you know, the great ones, you know, have, if they're in a human form, are going to have human foibles. But generally speaking, I think if you have some ability, you know, Krishna Das calls it a practice. Everybody has different words for it to connect with a another way of defining yourself, other than your day to day life, and in a broader consciousness uh, for a lot of people it's religion uh, i tend to 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 identify with words like god but other people don't it doesn't have to be that it's just whatever it takes to disassociate from whatever your current mood is and that that your mood doesn't define you moods come and go but there's a part of you that stays the same and getting in touch with that part of yourself however you do it uh, i think is uh, is good medicine yeah, absolutely. And as you brought up some examples, uh, people that have a spiritual practice, whereas their identity is not entangled in their role as an artist or a musician, because when it becomes that, it's never stable, it's never secure. Yeah, even they, if you can just get away from it for five minutes a day, yeah. at least there's some part of yourself that yeah. knows there's another self-definition. And, you know, in the music business, I was thinking it's changed a lot, obviously, in this era of streaming. But when I was at record companies, you know, so much revolved around the charts. You know, where are you on the charts? Right. Are you going up on the charts or down on the charts? Right. Are you number one? Are you in the top 50, or top 20? And, you know, the charts lasted one week. So if your identity is involved with where you are on the charts, you know, every single 52 weeks a year, you've got to be validated by this external metric, you know. Uh, and it's easy to get caught up in it. I used to get caught up in it when I was at record companies, uh, uh, but you don't want to be totally ruled by it. Yeah, I mean, I think what sets you apart, and not only from artists, but uh, executives and other people at record companies, is that your identity is not locked into your role, or you, you mentioned role, in the music business, because you have these other interests, uh, political interests, you're, you're a writer, you go beyond one purpose because a lot of people think i mean i talk to very successful executives in the record business and their identity is totally wrapped up in their success in the in the glamour the buzz the energy the fame the wealth of being in the record business and they tell me sometimes it can feel that every day is torture because their jobs now they're slaves to their jobs they're so attached and they have no other purpose in life and uh, I think what makes you not only a survivor, but somebody that's flourishing is you have more than one purpose. You realize that your purpose is just not limited to one thing. Your purpose is really limitless. And I think these practices show people that their purpose is limitless, whether yeah. it's the Buddhist chanting or meditation or mindfulness or religion, like you said, or, or, or connecting with God. It gives you a, a limitless purpose in life. Yeah, or some people it's fly fishing. Some people it's mountain climbing. I mean, it doesn't have to be part of some structured tradition. Yeah, I mean, in my case, a lot of it was born of necessity. You know, I, I, um, I got fired a lot of times. You know, uh, I had to reinvent my career a lot of times. Uh, I liked all of those things you were talking about, the, the buzz. <laughs> I know, it's, a, it's intoxicating. Believe me, it's very intoxicating. But it became clear to me that it was transient. And I did, I was kind of a product of the hippie era. You know, I graduated from high school in 1967. And in my mind, the rock and roll and all that stuff was intertwined with politics and spirituality. Because, you know, who was the biggest band? The Beatles. You know, John Lennon wrote Get Peace a Chance. And, 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 and George Harrison wrote My Sweet Lord. You know, so, so uh, t I always felt that, that those things were somehow inside my head connected. And some of that probably undermined my career, but some of it helped me connect with people. But it's kind of just how it went. I didn't plan it out that way. It just was kind of the product of the way my life went. And, and uh, in retrospect, I agree with you. It's been, a guy, it's, it's been enormously helpful because if you're just, uh, like I said, if you're just looking at where you are on the charts, well, there's a new number one record next week. You know, uh, even if you're number one, you won't be number one 
forever. Having said that, I quite liked it when I was involved with number one records. I wouldn't mind having one more before I <laughs> kick off. <laughs> they, you no, know, it's it's like the the bird singing in the gilded cage. It's yeah, it, it's a high. It's a huge high, yeah. high when yeah, you yeah. when you have a number one record and you get addicted to it. It's an ego addiction, and you know, a prince told his. Uh, his co-writer for his autobiography says, I, I have no more purpose in life. Yeah, that's so unfortunate. Oh. So they get so wrapped up. Now, you, you mentioned um, your beginnings with uh, the Ram Dass and, and your involvement with uh, the Krishna. Lately, you be, in the last four or five years, you've started to meditate regularly. Is, is that right? That is true. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't. I, I don't know the date, but I think it's at least five years. Uh, I, I always thought meditation was a good idea ever since I heard about it, which was a long time ago, probably in my late teens, early twenties. Certainly, Ram Dass, by the time Be Here Now came out, he wrote about meditation, and I would sometimes meditate. And I, I, I had a spiritual teacher named Tilda Charlton, who was a, who I met through Ram Dass, who was a great influence on me, but. But I found it hard to actually do it on any kind of a regular basis because I just, uh, I don't know why, my mind wandered. I just felt I couldn't do it. I psyched myself out of doing it for many, many years. But I did pray. I, 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 did, I did try at least once, a, once or twice a day to just mentally reach to this bigger energy. Again, I'm comfortable with that word God, but I would never push it on anybody. Right. And uh, so I always say to people, if you can't, med- prayer's easier than meditation. If meditation feels too hard, try praying. And you could just say, God, I don't even know if you exist, but if you do, help me, you know? And uh, even that, doing that, I, I found very helpful over the years. But I'm grateful that I was able to start meditating some years back. And at this time in my life, oh my goodness, I, I just I, I'm I'm almost addicted to that. Yeah. Um, by the way, somebody said that praying to God is talking to God, and meditating is listening to God. I, I think there's a lot of truth in that. Um, you know, uh, people get into that thing. Then is well, who's really doing the meditating? Is you know, like, is it my choice to have meditated, or uh-huh. does some other energy say, "Okay, uh-huh. dude, now now you're going to meditate"? You know, it's like I'm not sure how much of this is quote unquote me doing it, uh-huh. and and part of the this whole way of thinking is to try to, but but yeah, I I, I think that's a, that's a reasonably good way of of uh, of, of dividing the two. Uh, certainly, um, prayer's easier, but it's also can be quite beautiful and um I, for me it's been a, it's been very good I, a lot of my friends don't want to do it they have it, it reminds them of maybe something in their religious upbringing that they didn't like or it feels culty or you know it's again everybody's got their own thing but uh for me um it, it's been a tool that i'm really grateful for and with meditation you didn't re- like have like in my case. I started seventeen practicing zazen, learning zazen, mm. and um, and then in college, and then I just couldn't do it. It, it. My mind kept getting distracted. I couldn't focus. I got jittery. I, I was figuring I'm not made up for this. And then I tried again ten years later. Well, eventually I had a, an extreme panic attack, and my therapist prescribed meditation for me. So I kind of kind of was, my back was against the wall. I said, I've been trying to do this my whole life. And I finally was able to do it. It's about 15 years ago. But you, it seems like it was a, a slowly building thing. And then all of a sudden, I mean, you didn't have a crisis where you, you know, somebody said you have to meditate for your mental health, right? It just, somehow it just kicked in. Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I was really, when I was uh, 15, 16, 17, really was into psychedelics, and it was the 60s, and uh, I had good experiences with psychedelics. There came a time when I just sort of needed to make a living and be a little less uh, weird in terms of interacting with the rest of the world, and for me, it came time to stop, but I never regretted doing it, and it definitely opened up the idea to me that there was something bigger and then uh, around that same time is when uh, as silly as this sounds the the fact that the Beatles were talking about um, uh, Hindu practices and knew the Maharishi and for a minute that was the guy and then the the Hare Krishna um, uh, Swami Bhaktivedanta that uh, you know 
uh, and, and the use of the sitar and certain lyrics in some of their records were clearly from, um, you know, uh, mystical texts. Uh, and then, uh, and then when Be Here Now came out, you know, Ram Dass, which I think was 1970, I heard him first speak on the radio, be, like the year before he told all those same stories that are in Be Here Now in these lectures that were on the Pacifica radio station in New York, WBAI, which is where I first heard of him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just created this kind of way of looking at the universe that connected the psychedelic experience with these ancient traditions, and those traditions included meditation. So I, I, I kind of wanted to be on that team somehow, or into that consciousness. But I also never cared personally for organizations. You know, I, I, I had this, uh, you know, a stubborn streak that didn't like being told what to do. So I, um, uh, you know, and there were so many different weird, you know, there were wonderful saints that came to America and there were charlatans that came to America right. all trying to capitalize on the millions of people like me that had done psychedelics, had read Aldous Huxley or something and were kind of interested. So, um, you know, I was very cautious. Uh, but then again, through him, I met a teacher named Tilda Charlton and she never created an organization. She passed in 1989 never there was nothing to join there was never any money involved and her message was always about the interconnectivity of all the traditions that the same god that's in allah the same god that's from the the, the silence and emptiness of buddhism krishna jesus the ancient you know t talmudic wisdom uh, other esoteric traditions were all ultimately uh, leading to the same one truth and that really worked for me because it just made sense to me why would there was there a competition between judaism christianity and hinduism it just made no sense so that as a way and i guess that the word that people use for what i ended up gravitating to is a hindu word called bhakti mm -hmm. which is the idea of connecting with this through love through devotion more so than through uh, the other kind of uh, practices and um and that to this day is you know that idea of trying to get into your heart and 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 connect with love is 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 the thing that i keep coming back to but combining that with with being silent and sitting for at least a, for in in my case i'm into this sort of half hour in the morning thing uh and and i use a mantra everybody does it differently and there's so many wonderful ways of mm -hmm. connecting with the same thing mm -hmm. uh for me the the transition finally in my 60s into being a daily meditator has been a real blessing but uh, again there's a hundred or a thousand or a million different ways of getting to the same place and everybody follows what works for for them but that's what's worked for me i love that you were saying that did I do this? Is it me that's meditating? Is it this famous story yeah. that, that Sushi Roshi, the, uh, he uh, had a student who came to him and said, I finally can do Zazen. I sat Zazen all day yesterday. And the master says to him, never think that you are doing Zazen. Zazen is doing Zazen. Yeah, I think, I think that resonates with my notion of reality. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I don't always live that way. I don't always think that way. But if, but in a conversation like this, looking at that sentence, it seems completely true to me. Yeah, you you said something a little while ago that I, I I wanted to follow up on, which is that you feel that your nature, which has always been, I think, transcendent, compassionate, un it helped you in the music business. But it also could have undermined you. In what way could it have undermined? Well, you? I, I, what, what, what I, I wasn't exactly referring to transcendence or compassion. I was referring to the notion of having these other interests. The other interest, being able to talk to uh, artists, for example, or other people that one's working with about deeper things, whether it's politics or community building or, or, or spirituality, can be a plus because. It's a business where relationships and loyalty are incredibly important. On the other hand, it's also a business where focus is very important. And the extent that I would end up spending a disproportionate amount of time uh, on other things took time away from the people that are just really uh, disciplined about listening to every hit song and knowing every 
every, every, every detail of what's going on in the music business. So, so I think there's a trade-off between kind of broadening and focus. And so too much broadening can diminish focus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the last time we spoke, you, you were a, a record executive for many years, right? What you said, how many? I think it was thir well, 13, 13 years. Uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, I was involved with some smaller labels before that, but the core time was was thirteen years over. The, you know, through uh, you know a, a few different labels. Yeah, you ran a lot of these labels. Most of the time, I ran them. At Atlantic, I started as senior vice president on the West Coast, which was basically being head of A&R on the West Coast. And then I was promoted to president a year later. And then after that, all of my jobs at record companies, I was running them. I was president of Atlantic, chairman of Warner's briefly, uh, then um, president and chairman of the Mercury and the Mercury Records Group, which expanded to include some other labels. And then I had a label that was a financed indie label. It was a mid-sized label called Artemis. Right. So all of those last dozen years or so i was i was running those companies so uh how much money do you think you spent on payola over all those years you know you asked me this the other day yeah. i haven't a clue <laughs> first of all i don't think that radio promotion always is payola i think that radio promotion is is um is trying to get people to play a song on the radio, there's, there's certainly a lot of different ways of doing that, one of which is showing them research, one of which is uh, building up a relationship and asking for a favor. Uh, I never personally was involved with uh, Payola, but you know there were these independent radio promotion people that you would pay, especially at the major labels and especially on records that were being promoted in the pop radio formats. Um, and you know it's it's uh, you know the rumors were that some of them would have financial relationships with the programmers and uh, you know I, I never wanted to know because I never wanted to have any right. complicity. It's not really a it's a funny word payola. It's not very few people, a, a tiny number of people over the whole history of the record business ever were actually prosecuted for it. Uh, no one that I ever knew or heard of. Um, so. Um, you know, but but uh, you know, promotion is uh, was more expensive back in the day when we were selling CDs, and the amount of money coming in was so much greater than the value of radio airplay was that much greater. So mm -hmm. you could sp you'd spend more money to try to get it. That wasn't the only way of marketing. Obviously, music videos became very important when MTV emerged, and uh, there was no indie promotion with MTV. You had to go and talk them into it or not. Uh, but um, you know, um, I, I just I just have no idea, you know, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, but marketing usually um, in in the uh, in the old way of doing budgets. Uh, I, I again, I haven't been involved with record companies for the last 10 or 15 years. But mm -hmm. in the old way, you'd you'd usually try to average about 25 percent of the uh, of the uh, gross uh, of the income allocate that to marketing so wow. if you had uh, if you had the 200 million dollars worth of sales in a given year you'd probably have 50 million of that for marketing so of that 50 million how much of it was radio promotion you know probably uh, half of it and mm -hmm. then of that how much of it was was legit and how much was not legitimate i really have no idea sure. but i'm sure it would add up into the millions you know mm -hmm. but you know when when i you know there was usually at all the major labels, there was a promotion department, and the head of promotion would report to me, uh, but they would oversee all the different you know, activities. They would just sort of take direction on priorities and what the budgets were and so on. But it's not a subject I ever had that much interest in. You know, I just wanted to make sure I had people that could get the records on the radio if I thought they deserved to be on the radio. As you said, uh, there's a spectrum of the way records are promoted were promoted i mean i remember starting out we had managers and they were going to radio promotion the man one of the managers who, who by the way went on to have a huge successful career opens a drawer of empty coke bottles and says yeah this is how we've been promoting to to radio um yeah and, i never uh, saw such a drawer but i'm sure they existed that wasn't <laughs> the way i went about things but i certainly there was a lot of cocaine in america in general especially during the uh, you know, uh, 70s, uh, latter part of the 70s and early part of the 80s, and I guess the whole of the 70s. So, you know, there was a cocaine epidemic all over, and it certainly was in 
in the music business also. Uh, by that time, I was a non-druggie. My druggie years were when I was in high school and the year after high school. So I was usually the straight guy in the room after that. Well, you did psychedelics, right? Yeah, but not not when I was working for record companies. Of course. Oh, yeah, sure. No, you no. Know, by the time, not not out of any. It's just I changed in who what my day to day life was. Right. My psychedelic period was in my teens and maybe very early twenties. I I I I had stopped doing it by then. Not not because of it's it's just that's what I kind of needed to do to feel like happiness and functioning in the world and all that stuff. So I never I never was doing that when I was at record companies. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with doing psychedelics if you're at a record company i i just didn't do it right yeah and last time we spoke you said something and i wrote it down because i wanted to, to, to get it straight you said quote everything is rigged in show business in one way or another you remember that um i i don't really remember uh you know what what was the context i think uh, you were we were you know it started out with payola and then we, we talked about how uh, radio stations will have promotions, right? And, you know, the first... Uh... Well, what I was saying is that there's always some artificial reason why, at a, if, 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 you know, if, if there's sort of a hundred uh, records are released in a week and there's room on a playlist of a pop station for three new uh, tracks to get played... Um, they're going to 97 of the 100 are not going to get played. So why? This is not just true in America. It's true in England or any place where there's broadcasting reaching a big audience and with limited number of records they're playing. So, you know, one way would be bribing somebody. That's what they call payola, you know, I guess. Another way is there's these things uh, that's still a big deal, which is they'll ask a touring artist, I mean, back when they were touring, and we have to assume there'll be a post-pandemic <laughs> resurgence of touring, mm -hmm. you know, where they would ask the artists to do a quote-unquote radio show. So that's completely legal, but they asked the artist who maybe would be getting, you know, $100,000 for a show to do a show for either nothing or for a fraction of that. Right. And in return, they play the record. So why is that such a great system? I don't know. If, if, you, if you want to be played on the radio station and you're the artist, sometimes it's the right trade-off to make. But it doesn't seem like there's anything in, in, inherently more moral about that than just bribing somebody. It's just legal bribery. Mm -hmm. Then there's um, research, which is based on whoever the the researcher is and what technique they came up of when i was at mercury um i picked up a record you know we could pick up records from the international companies uh and nobody else wanted this record it was from new zealand and it was a song by a, a, a group called omc i think was the name and they had a song called how bizarre it became a number one single i just heard it at an international conference and liked the chorus and nobody else wanted it there was no money involved because it was already with another part of polygram so I asked the promotion guy, I said, look, man, this thing was a hit in New Zealand. That doesn't mean it's going to be a hit anywhere else, but just give it a shot. And then about a month later, I saw him, his name, uh, I'm trying to remember his name now, Steve. He passed away a while ago. Anyway, so this guy's name was Steve. So I said, Steve, what happened with How Bizarre? He says, oh, it's not a hit, man. You know, it got, uh, we got to play in a few stations and they did the research and, and, uh, you know, it didn't, it didn't, um, uh, it didn't research well. I said, oh, shit. So then um, about a, a few, about one more month goes by and we're in the card and he says, hey, how bizarre is a smash? I said, well, I thought you told me it wasn't a hit. <laughs> he said, here's what happens. He said, when they do research, here's what the research was. They get a, 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 a list of people that they're calling who are of the demographic that the advertisers want. Maybe it's 18 to 34 year old women or whatever it is. And they call these people on the phone and they play them a 10 second excerpt from 30 songs. And based on how people react to that excerpt, that's either good research or bad research. And, and if, it's, if it's good, then the station says, oh, okay, we, we know that our audience likes this, and they increase the amount of airplay. And if it's bad research, they say, oh, our audience doesn't like it. So he said, so originally, uh, somebody, uh, I don't know whether it was him or somebody else selected the part of the, the record. There was this record, which is what I also thought the chorus was, where the guy would say, how bizarre, how bizarre. And that didn't research well. He says, he says I just, it bugged me. So I had this idea 
to take another part of the song where there was a melodic chorus where background uh. singers would sing, baby, you're driving me crazy. He says, and that research is number one. Uh -huh. So because of changing which 10 seconds was played over the phone uh -huh. to people that were called up by researchers, it went from being a flop to number one. So what I'm saying is it's, it's, it's a fragile, weird system and that's considered the most quote unquote objective way of playing things is based on quote unquote research. But research is not like uh, the law of gravity. It's not pure science. It's informed by statistical and scientific ideas, but it depends like on anything else. How do you ask the question? You know, uh, what's the algorithm? These things are created by human beings. They're not created by like some mathematical, you know, certainty. So, so it's always an imperfect system. Look, we saw that movie, I probably, you probably saw it, that won the Oscar a few years ago for Best Documentary, Searching for Sugar Man. You know, it never got a shot here. It becomes yeah. this gigantic hit in South Africa. Yeah. That would never happen today because today with the internet, the word would have spread. Right. You know, that was just a quirk of fate. A, that it didn't get the exposure here and B, that it did in South Africa. So there's no perfect system. But if you represent an artist, whether you're a manager or you're the record company person who signed them, you want people to hear the music. And as long as it's not hurting anybody or breaking any laws, to me, whatever it takes. Yeah, so now you have Spotify and Apple Music. And I think the quote I had uh, was after you were talking about Spotify, actually. Okay, well, I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> well, you know, we we kick it off by recognizing that Spotify is <clears throat> certainly has a, a lot of ownership by major labels, and major labels control the playlists. Uh, well, the I don't know. I, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure. You know how it all works. I wouldn't go that far. I mean, I think that labels have have definitely an involvement with it. I think if you have a huge library uh, uh, that's ten or fifteen or twenty percent of all the music people are streaming, you're going to have more clout than I have with just you know half a dozen artists that I manage. Uh, and um, I think the playlists are mostly done by people who are. Um, you know, music freaks and who find out through testing different things what works. I mean, I, I think a lot of it is is authentic, but I think major labels have an advantage. I think generally people with a lot of money in this world have a lot of advantage over people with less money. I mean, that's the way of the world. I, I, I you know, it, it's not, but what are you going to do about it? It's, it's the planet Earth. You know, we do the best we can, but uh, I don't... Uh, I don't, I, I think it's always going to be an imperfect thing. There's certain music that's so compelling that no matter if it was on the worst label with the worst manager, with the worst promotion, it just becomes a hit anyway. Mm -hmm. And there's always things that the wealthiest and most powerful people support that flop anyway. But in between, there are some things that, you know, uh, maybe would have had a shot if they'd been promoted differently and other things, uh, you know, that wouldn't have been successful if a lot of money wasn't put behind them. It's, but it's true of, uh, you know, books, movies, what, you know, it's just the way of the world. I, I, I don't, um, I think the main thing is, uh, do the best you can and, uh, bet on the music. Cause at the end of the day, it's the music itself that makes people like it or not like it. It's just the, the, the entire job of all marketing is to get people to listen to the music. Right. Then it's between the music and the listener. It has nothing to do with the marketing. It's just getting them to hear it. Yeah, you, you made an interesting analogy between the record clubs that they used to have yeah. and, and Spotify. Can you talk a little well, bit? Well, the, the, you know, the similarity was that um, the major labels uh, would get giant, get giant advances uh, from from uh, the record clubs in those days and Spotify now. And so the, the incentives are, are somewhat different. I, again, I'm not involved with the major label world today. And, you know, I don't want to get too ahead of myself in understanding what's going on with, with how Spotify works. I love Spotify. That's how I listen to music. Uh, I wish the artists, I wish artists got, uh, and songwriters especially got, paid more yeah uh, it, it was a better a more predictable and understandable economic model back when we were selling physical objects but um 
you know, there's also as a as a listener, I love that anywhere I am in the world on my phone, I can listen to almost any song I want, almost any time. Uh, so it's just what happened. There's just nothing you can do about it except work with the system the way it is. And again, once the pandemic is over, uh, or you know, then live music comes back, and that's a, that's a huge part of the business is the concert and live business and very important way that a lot of artists make money and a lot of fans really have the most intimate experience with music and that has nothing to do with any of these things. Right. Would you talk a little bit about how you meditate? Well, I mean, the main thing is sitting and not moving and staying silent. I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't, uh, you know, I just sort of picked up what I read from different books, but I just sit quietly and straight and uh, I concentrate on uh, mantras, you know, that I've learned over the years. But the basic idea that Krishna Das talks about of repeating holy names, mm -hmm. you know, is something I subscribe to. You know, it works for me. And these holy names he recommended? Or? No, no, no. Everybody's got different holy names. Uh, you know, I mean, some of them are uh, part of the, uh, you know, Hindu cosmology, like Krishna. I love the word Krishna. Mm -hmm. Rama, mm -hmm. the, the different mm -hmm. names of the Divine Mother, Kali, Durga, mm -hmm. Saraswati, but also the name Jesus has great power and beauty to it. Mm -hmm. uh, many other names uh, of different uh, traditions. But, um, you know, I, I, I just, uh, uh, you know, it's a private, personal thing that right. you have to do inside yourself. No one else can do it for you. But there are an awful lot of books that you can read about it and to get guidance and see what works for you. There's hundreds of them. Many of my friends are into Buddhist meditation techniques. I'm just not qualified to talk about them. But I would say I know more people that meditate that way than the way that I do it. But uh, I think the main thing is having your mind concentrate on something other than the running uh, chatter of your of your thoughts and your moods is to is to, is to be able to concentrate the mind. Right. Some people, it's just about trying to have an emptiness and not think about anything. I've always found that difficult to do, but it's it's a, it's a beautiful and great tradition. I I've gone the easier route of 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 uh, repetition of mantra, and there's different mantras that I've used at different times. None of them are particularly secret, but. Neither do I think it's like the kind of thing you just talk about on a podcast. I think you could open up many, many books. The books that I've liked the best about spirituality, I would certainly start with Autobiography of a Yogi, um, The Gospel According to Sri Ramakrishna. Certainly mm. Ram Dass is Be Here. And Ram Dass is Be Here now, in addition to it being a compelling description of his story, he has a list in the back of, uh, I think, 50 to 100 books uh, and I read many of those books. I really trusted his curation uh, that way. And, you know, I think you just find what works for you. And then there are other people that I'm inspired by that are not considered um, officially spiritual gurus. But like I, I often um, will listen to some of the sermons of Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, you know, I feel that he's remembered more as a political figure, but he was also a mystic and a, and a powerful uh, uh, preacher that was infused with the spirit. And, you know, online, you can find the sermons as distinguished from some of the more political speeches, and some of them are just incredible. Yeah, well, that's, that's all great stuff. And and this idea of of focusing concentrating on the names of God, we knew about Hare Krishna, never really sunk in. Um, I, I'm very familiar with the Kabbalistic meditation mm. where you're yeah, concentrating. Yeah. On... I, I I have always been so respectful of that and honored it. I never learned about Kabbalah, but there's no question that that's uh, you know at the highest level of of spiritual uh, essence and, 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 and wisdom, you know. You know, the Christian thing, it's funny, I was always a little scared of the Hare Krishna because back when I was in my in the 70s, you'd go to any airport, yeah. there were <laughs> always these people dancing around, uh, uh, wearing these um, weird robes, and they, 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 they had these extremely unusual haircuts of their shaved head, but with one top knot, and uh, I just never wanted to, like, be part of that thing. It just felt right. culty to me. But on the other hand, there was a sweetness about it that appealed to me. 
And the other thing was that in a lot of the cities, New York included, they would have these free vegetarian meals that were incredible and that they would give on weekends or whatever. But I remember one time I was in Central Park and, um, and a kid, a Hare Krishna person came up to me and he's handing me something. And I just always recoiled. I still do when somebody's pushing something on me. But he just mm -hmm. gave me this picture. So I took it just so he'd go away. And I looked at it. It's a picture of Krishna. And on the back, it said something along the lines that if you just say the name Krishna once with love, you're blessed, you know, for the rest of your life. And I thought to myself, that's a good deal. You know, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I, um, yeah. I, I, and for all I know, that's what changed my life, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, everybody finds what they find. You know, nature is incredible. I think you could just have nature as your guru. You know, uh, and obviously Henry David Thoreau, right. uh, you know, uh, kind of is a doorway into that. Right. Emerson yeah. uh, wrote incredible things yes. about nature. Yes. Um, and the oversoul. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's all the same thing. It's different ways the human mind comes to it. And of course, I only speak English. There's all these <laughs> other languages that have totally different pathways, you know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's great that you brought up uh, Thoreau and, and Emerson. They, they translated the, the, the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, yeah. If you go yeah. to Concord, where they lived, in the Concord Museum, there the, you can see the displays of the Bhagavad Gita. Oh, wow, they, I've they, never been there. That's definitely on my to-do list if I get close. I've been rereading some of Emerson. During, you know, during the pandemic, there's like more time for reading for some of us. And, you know, so... It's 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 not the easiest thing in the world to read, but the no. purity and brilliance of it is still palpable. And I'm I'm working my way through this anthology of Emerson's writings just to tune into that, especially when he wrote about nature, you know, because um, being surrounded by trees and all that sort of a thing. So, you know, there's there's uh, some people with music. I mean, there's so many different ways of approaching this it's just it's, the main by thing the way, is it's to find... so co coincidental interrupt you but it's so coincidental because i'm also reading emerson oh far out yeah and and it's about the oversoul do you know we're all part of this one big yeah consciousness yeah. and and then he says something that which is a definition of mindfulness he goes i'm a surprised spectator of my thoughts yeah I mean, yeah. and you're right. He's difficult to read because he'll put, you know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't flow linearly. Well, like it's, it's, you know, we're in the 21st century and he was, you know, in the 19th, you know, it's, it's a long time ago, but, uh, you know, another, um, I just was watching on, um, there's all these streaming channels now. So NBC's is called Peacock and it debuted yesterday. So there's a mini series based on Brave New World. Uh -huh. So I only watched about 20 minutes of it. I'm not sure if it's any good or not, but it made me start thinking about Aldous Huxley, another amazing American saint. I mean, he was originally British, but the last, I think, 20 years of his life, he lived in Los Angeles. And, you know, uh, obviously Doors of Perception was this huge influence on the whole psychedelic scene. I mean, both Leary and then Richard Alpert, later to become Ram Dass, were enormously influenced by it, and they both got to know Huxley. Um and, you know, you read The Doors of Perception and he talking about mescaline. I mean, it's exactly like, you know, in this in the 1940s or 50s, what people would later experience in the in, in this in the 60s. So, you know, it's uh, there are a lot of a uh, lot of, uh, you know, uh, lighthouses out there if you start looking for them. Yeah. And it's another coincidence that you mentioned the NBC and the Peacock, because the guests that I have just before you is a music supervisor. And guess what shows, you know, one of the shows she supervises is the Goldbergs. Oh, is that right? <laughs> I've, I've never seen the Goldbergs, but, uh, but uh, you know, I, uh, good name. Well, I, on that uh, uplifting note, <laughs> I'm sure we could ramble on discursively ad infinitum, but uh, our time is up. And uh, is there anything, I know you have a new book coming out. Well, I won't have a new book out till next year. I'm writing it now. It's about the relationship between entertainment and politics during 2020, uh, the Trump era. And I don't know yet if it's going to have a happy Hollywood ending or mm -hmm. if it's a Shakespearean tragedy, but it'll be published in September of 2021. So maybe you can have me back on when it comes out. Oh, I'd love to. Oh, yeah. Let, remind me. Let me know. I'd love I to. Will. I will. All right. Thank you so much for having me. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for, for coming and subjecting yourself to my uh, merciless grilling. And uh, I look forward to you coming back to talk about the new book, if right, not man. sooner. God bless. Later. God bless. All right, everybody. If you like this podcast, please leave a uh, message to the world by giving us a rating, a high rating, hopefully, and a review. Follow us on Wolf and Tune on IG mainly, but we're also on Twitter a little bit. And uh, I want to thank a couple of people that worked on this, Lonnie Rinaldo and my co-producer, the Hannah Bowers. So until next time, let's all stay up in a higher octave and let's you and I stay in tune.